What is going on, everybody? Welcome back. It is the return of Walk and Carpet, the Geekiverse's all Star Wars show. It's been a long time coming. Super, super happy to rev- revive the show here on this uh, Star Wars day. I'm Josiah Leroy. Joining me from New York City. Super excited to have him back in the Geekiverse. Luke Skywalker himself. Look at him. <laughs> Look at him. Brian Patrick Stoyle. BPS, how are you doing, my friend? I'm hanging in there, Josiah. I'm doing just fine. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, we are super stoked to have you. Uh, Brian and I are going to co-host this on a monthly basis. Uh, this is actually technically episode 31. I had to go back and double check. We haven't done this show in, in a while. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the last episode we did, we we kind of talked about what we thought Ray's lightsaber might look like in episode nine. So this, you know, we're, it's a ways back. But anyway, we're rebooting the show. We're happy to be here. We're talking not just on podcast forum, but also in video forum at youtube.com slash the Geekiverse. So if you are a follower of the Geekiverse, whether that's on our social media or YouTube, you name it, you know a great deal about me because I talk and I never shut up. So Let's learn a little bit about BPS. Brian, why don't you give just maybe a little bit of background on your love of, of Star Wars slash fand- other fandoms and then uh, maybe just some of the, the the groups that you've been involved with over the years. Uh, basically, sure. long story short, Brian and I uh, met uh, through uh, a production he was involved in and still is involved in, uh, but mm-hmm. this was in 2016 or 17. I, I don't recall now, but uh, we got to talking and we had Brian on an episode of Walking Carpet, which was wonderful. And uh, we've, we've kept in touch ever since. So it's been a, a nice friendship, but uh, Brian, why don't you take it away? Sure. Um, so I've been a star Wars fan since I was 12 years old. That was 1996, right around the fever pitch of the marketing for the prequel trilogy. Uh, shadows of the empire came out that year. The THX VHS re-release of the original trilogy had just come out the year prior. So star Wars was just coming back into the zeitgeist into, uh, you know, full force, as it were. <laughs> uh, all the action figures were out. So it was a really good time to be a kid who liked Star Wars. And I hopped on that bandwagon almost begrudgingly at first, which is kind of funny looking back now. I actually was uh, a Star Trek fan before I was a Star Wars fan. Uh, fun fact. <laughs> I did not know that about you. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's uh, it's very interesting. Um, but yeah, Star Wars has just forever become my favorite sandbox to play in. And I am very excited to find ways to share that love with uh, the world, you know, whether it be through something like this with podcasts and discussions or with uh, the project in Buffalo with uh, Buffalo Buys and Star Wars Night uh, or expanding that through the cosplay groups like the Northridge in Buffalo or the Rebel Legion, which I'm also a member of, which is a worldwide uh, costuming organization. Dude, it's 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 so awesome to see, and we we see it on a, a large scale nowadays. People get involved with their favorite fandoms, and um, mm-hmm. it, you know, in the few years I've known you, that's that's always been it. Whether it was you know Buffalo Buys and Star Wars Night is always such a hit. It's always one of the the most fun nights. Uh, it was we're you know in buffalo new york here so that every summer that is a, a popular event obviously this year's a little bit crazy with what's going on in the world but that being mm-hmm. said uh that that's always something super awesome to look forward to so um thank you man yeah absolutely uh we're gonna go through on a like we said a month-to-month basis here and kind of the format of the show we're gonna bring up a few things uh, we've got different segments. First one is going to be f- uh, kind of the fact of the episode, just a fun fact that maybe you didn't know or uh, maybe you're just learning for the first time here. We're going to also talk about this date in Star Wars history. We'll get to a bunch of new segments for anything and everything Star Wars, and then we'll typically have a topic or two that we want to talk about in the meat of the episode. So uh, we're going to get started right away here. Uh, fact of the episode. It's something uh, that I actually brought up uh, to the boys on our video game podcast, uh, Geek Scott Game. Check that out if you're a gamer. But uh, I always thought it was interesting that there was an episode one and an episode three movie tie-in video game. But there was no episode two game. So nothing for Attack of the Clones, despite all of the games that LucasArts produced uh, during those early 2000s. That being said, uh, I looked into it a little bit and kind of randomly came across it at the same time. Uh, you may have heard of one of the most popular Star Wars games of all time, Knights of the Old Republic. Uh, it came out 2003 for the uh, originally on the Xbox. 
uh, Bioware, who has gone on to making incredible franchises such as uh, Mass Effect and Dragon Age, they they started with this. LucasArts approached them to make an Attack of the Clones video game, but gave them the option whether they wanted to pursue an Attack of the Clones tie-in or craft something that was completely original. They opted for something original, and thus we got Knights of the Old Republic. Kind of crazy to think about. Because the game is, is has been so successful and is is on so many fans' top lists. Not even just Star Wars games, but video games in general. Top games of all time. It's kind of crazy to think. We could have had maybe possibly a crappy movie tie-in game instead. <laughs> <laughs> I think they made the right choice. Uh, it's definitely got a lot more replay value than uh, Jedi Starfighter or Racer Revenge. And no slight <laughs> to those games, but you know, it's definitely a little bit more uh, in the fandom uh memory than just the tie-in games that's yeah. actually very fascinating i didn't realize that was the case i feel like that's a super little known fact um yeah and kind of came across it brought it up on geek scott game and here we are um fun fact also i played star wars racer revenge last week there's a uh, <laughs> a uh, <laughs> ps4 re-release that happened last summer by limited run games so they do exactly as they sound they have limited runs just either in the hundreds or thousands of of old school video games and their thought is they put them on physical media so that you don't ever lose them as we go all digital here and one of them was racer revenge and they brought it to ps4 so uh i had to scoop that up and i played it and man brought back some good memories uh Uh, good stuff i played the i played the original racer a lot and i missed that game very much uh i'm very excited and jealous i don't own a nintendo switch but i know they are re-releasing it for the switch soon Yes. And I kind of want to buy a Switch now just for that game, which is, you know, funny because that's a 20 year old video game that's enticed me to buy a current generation system. But I would totally do it for original racer. <laughs> hey, that is a game that I'm definitely <laughs> picking up as soon as it comes out. I, I cannot wait to play nice. it. Um, <laughs> the uh, this date in Star Wars history. So today, May the 4th, May the 4th be with you, of course, Star Wars Day. We thought it, of course, fitting to bring back walking carpet. But um the origin of it, not just from the movies, but as I was kind of scooping through for, for facts and, and figures for this episode, uh, this one is courtesy of Newsweek. So in 1979, when uh, Margaret Thatcher became the UK's first female prime minister, uh, to celebrate the victory, Thatcher's party backers took out a newspaper ad with the tongue-in-cheek text, May the 4th be with you, Maggie. Congratulations. Kind of interesting uh, that all you know all the way back there in 1979, the Star Wars is a little more than two years old from a theatrical standpoint, and mm-hmm. uh, already we see it so prevalent in in pop culture. Kind of amazing to think about oh, more than 40 years later now. Yeah, the Force is powerful, but not as powerful as a good pun. Oh my gosh, <laughs> you! It's it's going to be a beautiful, beautiful relationship here. <laughs> I've uh, what I've realized it. So I have a one and a half year old, and mm-hmm. being a dad is the role I was born to play. Because I've been doing da- cheesy dad jokes my whole life, but now I have an excuse to do them. So it's good. Uh, we'll get on to the the news here. We've got six uh, items that we want to get to on today's episode. First of all, uh, we've got some good stuff that ties in the world of of the Marvel Star Wars comics. Uh, Dr. Aphra is going to be getting an audiobook and uh, coming in just a few months' time. Brian, do you want to speak a little bit more to this one? Yes. It was announced on StarWars.com recently that the um, original Marvel Comics Darth Vader series 1 through 4 was getting an audio drama adaptation. So what they are going to be doing is telling an expanded version of this comic book story arc that actually introduces this character, Dr. Afra, who worked with Darth Vader in kind of a um, for hire mercenary companion role for a few uh, issues of Darth Vader's comic series, retelling that story through her point of view. So it's going to be an expanded um, retelling with Afra as the main character, as opposed to the very fascinating side character to Vader's story. And this is going to be done in a manner very similar to the Dooku Jedi Lost audio drama that, that um, Audible put out last year, where they're going to have a full cast doing all of the voice roles. So it won't sound exactly like an audiobook where you have one narrator doing every single character, every single line. It's going to be treated as an actual, you know, radio play, which I always find very fascinating. I love that art form, and I think that that's going to be a very fun way to bring 
that story into the um, the ears, I guess, of uh, new fans. So this is going to be a um, a one-time release of the novel on July 21st by new Star Wars author Sarah Kuhn. So uh, Dr. Ephra, I, I've... I think she's one of the best original characters that have come out of the new uh, Disney Star Wars era canon. Uh, I love the the Darth Vader comic series. I think that you know that's my personal favorite one uh, that Marvel has done in recent years. And um, with Doctor Aphra, obviously a popular enough character, well received enough to get her own comic uh, series. So here to see that she's you know we're going a step further and getting an audio book is a really nice thing. She's someone I'd love to see in uh, um maybe a TV series on Disney plus one day, or even um, in some sort of anthology movie. I think uh, her and the kind of the cast of characters they've surrounded her with, with the droids in particular are mm-hmm. things that fans would love. And it just seems tailor made for it. Um, yeah. For and- any star Wars fan, who's not familiar with Dr. Afra, you really should check out this book or check out the comic uh, series. She has become so popular. She has dropped into pretty much every Marvel storyline set during the original trilogy at some point, and then got her own mainline series, which Marvel's strategy for comics so far has mostly been to follow the film characters. And she's one of the few people who got uh, an ongoing series as an original character, which is a great sign. And her transitioning from comics to audiobook, and if it goes the way the Dooku, the Dooku book does, it'll get a print version eventually. So this transcending of media is a really good sign because that means there's a lot of investment in that character. So you may very well just get your wish. Yeah, I, uh, I'd i be all about that, let me tell you. <laughs> um, bullet point number two here. We've got some new actors coming to the Cassian Andor Disney Plus series. Uh, we know the series takes place about five years before Rogue One. And uh, there's, there's a nice list here, two uh, pretty familiar names if you were a Star Wars fan or a Marvel fan or even Pirates of the Caribbean, if you will. Uh, mm-hmm. But, uh, Brian, why don't you run down some of who are going to be joining that series? So we have the additions of Kyle Soller, Denise Goff, and then our two familiar names that you are uh, alluding to. We have Stellan Skarsgård, otherwise known as Dr. Er- Eric Selvig from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and Genevieve O'Reilly, who is no stranger to Star Wars, having appeared as Mon Mothma since Revenge of the Sith. Yeah. She, um, I love that she's kind of been here all these years now, on and off. Um, she, mm-hmm. as Brian mentioned, Genevieve was in Revenge of the Sith. You got to look fast because it's a quick scene. Uh, but she is also in a deleted scene, um, in Revenge of the Sith alongside Padme and Bail Organa, and it's kind of uh, the the planting of the seed of the rebellion. They're 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 talking some some heavy stuff there, and I that would have been a nice. Uh, scene to to see in the movie but if you haven't seen it check it out i know it is on the the uh, extra features for the the dvd and blu-ray so that being said she got to reprise her role in rogue one which i loved as soon as i heard that that was announced i thought that was a a wonderful callback and of course now we get to see her again here uh in the cassian andor disney plus series speaking of which there uh if we move on to bullet point three here just to tie in a little bit we are getting a familiar face uh, in Tony Gilroy coming back as showrunner, Brian. Yes. Uh, and originally, we had uh, Stephen Schiff scheduled to showrun the Cassian Andor series. That has recently changed. He has stepped down. And we now have Tony Gilroy, who is the person who is kind of credited with saving the screenplay for Rogue One uh, in the Zero Hour. He is uh, the gentleman who was brought in to rewrite the last act of Rogue One and make it what it is. So for fans who enjoyed the Battle of Scarif, Darth Vader's hallway scene, all of that, you have this man to thank. And now he's going to be the man who's in charge of getting the Cassian Andor series created and out on a Disney+. And I think that's a very exciting uh, proposition for the tone of that show because you're going to have that gritty war feel that was in Rogue One transition very strongly with him at the helm. And I'm happy they're tying in... Um, you know, I wasn't sure when this series was announced with Cassian Andor if it was going to be more of Cassian's uh, a focus on him as an independent person as opposed to what he's going to be doing involved with the Rebel Alliance. I, I want to see those inner workings. I want to see what was going on, f- you know, five years before Rogue One and, in effect, A New Hope with, with, you know, behind the scenes 
what kind of missions were they going on? What kind of intel were they collecting? I, I think mm-hmm. that's that's just that's going to be a nice series with Tony Gilroy coming back to do this. As you mentioned, uh, he, you know, credited with saving, especially that, that third act, which is just absolutely fantastic in rogue one. I can't wait to see what he does when they turn him loose on a series like this. Oh yeah. And it's fascinating too, because you know, that's an era that we're very familiar with. Thanks to things like rogue one, as well as star Wars rebels. Yes. And it's going to be very fascinating to see. I think you're probably going to see a little bit of both, you know, where the uh, the alliance is forming because we know thanks to Rebels about when Mon Mothma gave her speech that the rebellion is, you know, forming, she's breaking away from the Senate, she officially becomes a war criminal. And, mm-hmm. you know, you kind of have a vague timeline of that thanks to Rebels and other tertiary media. But at the same time, those were very splintered, small, independent cells for a long time. And Cassian was in this fight since he was six years old. So (laughs) that's a lot of independent fighting going on. So I think over the course of that series, if it runs a couple of seasons, I think we are going to have a very fascinating journey of seeing both him doing official missions for the rebellion and individual fights of, you know, justice or vengeance or what have you. It's going to be very, very fascinating to watch. And it's a great thing because we'll have Diego Luna as Cassian, and of course we'll we'll enjoy every minute with Ellen Tudyk as K two S O. Yes, yeah. <laughs> breathe me in some of that. I love it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I I made this point on um, our hindsight Star Wars series in, around Christmas time that I think I think K two is my favorite Star Wars droid ever, and that's saying a lot. I know, but uh, you know, I, I think it's a pretty good argument. That's a great argument. There's a lot of good droid characters, and K2 is right up there. And I think Disney's done a really good job, especially with a lot of their droids in, in the different media that's that's come out, whether it's K2 or, or BB-8. Uh, you know, I could go on and on about that. Um, moving on, we've got... Uh, so today, May 4th, you're not only able to watch Walking Carpet, which is wonderful, hopefully, for you. Uh, Disney Gallery, The Mandalorian, uh, is going to be an eight-part series debuting weekly. It's going to show behind-the-scenes footage of The Mandalorian, roundtable discussion with the the creative staff and showrunner, uh, John Favreau, on just exactly what it was like to make what was an incredibly well-received TV show. I got to say, Brian, I I miss the days when Blu-rays and DVDs would have hours upon hours of extra features behind the scenes. I love that stuff, especially Star Wars and Marvel, because those people, in a lot of cases, love it just as much as I do. And they, you see that passion poured out. We're going to see Dave Filoni. We're going to see John Favreau, um, Deborah Cho, a list of people here who love Star Wars and love The Mandalorian, and I can't wait to see him gush about it. What is your thoughts on this? Are you excited about it? Do you care about things like behind the scenes extra features? Uh, give me your thoughts. I am so pumped for this series. I'm going to devour every single episode as soon as it's available. I love these discussions. I love John Favreau as a creative and a moderator. Like he's hosted roundtable discussions for other things before. He's very good at that. So those conversations are going to be so just, you know, insightful and meaningful. He's really good at getting people to open up and talk about, you know, these topics. And I am so fascinated to watch more about the stagecraft process. Are you familiar with stagecraft? Like how they shot the series with the sets? Yes. Yeah, the the big, you know, L, LCD monitor screens, essentially. And I'm so excited to watch more of that footage of how it was actually done. That just gets me so amped. I'm so pumped to watch more of that. Yeah, I'm totally with you there. Like I saw uh, just the teaser they released for it and my eyes were open wide because that is something mm-hmm. I am not terribly familiar with past what we saw there and oh, yeah. uh, that's got my interest really peaked and the other thing is uh john favreau i've really really come to enjoy over the years uh it feels like he just is successful with just about anything he, he does whether that was his hand in iron man and the mcu uh I, even things like i've really become obsessed with the chef show on netflix i, I love just seeing him hang out and doing what he does and uh, i feel like if there's there's a short list of people i'd love to hang out with for a day like he'd be on that list i think oh definitely yeah he's a wonderful conversationalist just spending time with that man would be a joy yeah i i couldn't agree more so that uh, again uh first episode releasing today may 4th and they'll be releasing those on a week-to-week basis i'm with brian i'll be watching them as soon as each episode releases uh we are unfortunately almost at the end of the clone wars 
So um, at the time for us filming this, we've only seen two episodes of the the Siege of Mandalore, so the the final arc in the series. Um, we'll keep it a l- relatively spoiler free here. We assume you're list you're listening to a Star Wars podcast. You've probably seen the episodes, but just in case. Uh, so we we've just got a little bit to go, and I, I imagine we will record uh, a discussion on on the final season of the Clone Wars. But Brian, give me your take. Uh, what we've seen so far with the Siege of Mandalore story. Oh, oh, <laughs> gosh. It's so good. It's so good. This is the best that show has ever looked, among the best it's ever been written. And I'm surprised to say that. Not that I didn't think the Siege of Mandalore was going to be good or entertaining, but I, without getting into spoilers, I went into the second episode of the arc, you know, um, it's not much of a surprise seeing the marketing for Clone Wars, yeah. whether you've seen it or not, that Ahsoka and Maul are kind of the adversaries at the head of that arc of the story. I think that's safe enough to say. Oh, yeah, that's fine. And it's so fascinating now watching that storyline, knowing that this storyline was originally supposed to come out sometime around 2014, 2015 with assuming Disney never bought Lucasfilm and it continued its run on Cartoon Network and it had seven or eight seasons, you know, as the initial plan seemed to be. Mm -hmm. And it's so fascinating watching the story through the lens of like what it was originally supposed to be and seeing what it is now, because there are a lot of tie-ins to the Disney era Star Wars properties that you know were not there when they originally were plotting this out. Not that they couldn't have dropped those kinds of things in later. Obviously, they did now. But it's so fascinating to see little Easter eggs that I don't want to mention for sake of spoilers. But it's pretty prevalent to those who have seen the arcs that, you know, oh, it's that character from this or, oh, it's that visual from that thing or what have you, which would not have existed had this last season not been originally canceled and now just merely postponed. It's so interesting watching it now. And it's weird to me it for the character standpoint because i went into that second episode thinking wow this really took the wind out of the sails of this storyline considering we know now that maul survives and ahsoka survives because of their appearances in solo and rebels among you know other things so the stakes for seeing these two characters who at the time of the clone wars initial release were either original or didn't have their fates decided you could have easily been at the edge of your seat thinking either Ahsoka or Maul would not make it out at the end of that story arc. Obviously, now we know that they do because they both go on to have future stories. But that didn't change anything in how amazing the writing of that story is. Like, it doesn't matter that you know that those characters are going to live. Like, that life or death stakes is, I don't want to say irrelevant, but they added so much more into the mythos of revenge of the sith into these character arcs and motivations and to just see where these people are at these points in their lives is so fascinating add to that the beautiful motion capture work that they did for that lightsaber duel the amazing animation i mean the disney resources for lucasfilm animation are astounding the the smoothness of the movements, the newer character models, the updated visuals, the depth of field in the shots. Like you see a wide shot and you see, or not a wide shot, but you see like a close up on Ahsoka and the background is so far off and it's all just blurry and out of focus. Like it was filmed on a camera and they didn't do stuff like that very much in the old days of the earlier seasons of the Clone Wars. And it's so beautiful to watch now. It's so complex and so, mm. Yeah. Oh, I just, I'm sorry. I, I went on a journey watching those two episodes so far. And I know many people listening to this will have seen the end of the arc and are just going, Oh, just wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got to say, Brian, you, I was laughing at first. Cause you, when I you said, you know, describe it, you just kind of, Oh, that's how I feel. <laughs> that's how I feel. Uh, those two episodes, man. Well, let's go to the first one of the, the end of uh, the seizure or the seizure of Mandalore. Excuse me. That mm-hmm. one. I, uh, like instantly crowned probably my favorite episode of anything Clone Wars ever. And that was surprising to me that I would, I would say that. Um, so someone had texted me before I was able to watch the second one and said, have, have you seen the second episode here yet in this arc? And I said, uh, no, I haven't, but I cannot believe how much I like the first one. Like 
audibly cheering, clapping, edge of my seat the whole time. Like my wife is playing Animal Crossing on the Switch, and I'm j- I'm just like I'm. It was like I was at a sports event basically, and uh, then in texting this individual, he texts back and said, you're going to have a new favorite episode. And I was like, Oh, I can't wait. And I, I, there's an argument to be made that that is an even better episode. Um, the thing that was of most note to me is what you mentioned. And it was the motion capture, especially in the, the mall and Ahsoka stuff, Mm -hmm. man, Ray park, beautiful, beautiful opportunity to bring him back for uh, another shot at Darth Maul. And, uh, what, was wonderful as Dave Filoni said in kind of a behind the scenes thing is that he finally got to merge um, Ray Park and Sam Whitmer. Really? Mm -hmm. I mean, granted they both did solo, but that wasn't much of anything. This was, you know, really a truly incredible action sequence. And honestly, I felt like a really nice amount of time for a lightsaber duel. Um, it, It was just, it was impressively done. It just, like you said, it looks unbelievable. And one thing I never considered, and this is maybe speaking to how lost I got in the episode and how amazing it was, was that I wasn't even thinking for a second that, Oh, Maul and Ahsoka both live. I never That's even considered that. Or going back and saying, you know what? This would have come out 2014, maybe 2015 around there. And we wouldn't have known what would have happened. Uh, maybe they would have killed off one of those characters at that point. But it just didn't matter to me. It, it didn't. Yeah. And I didn't even think about it until you brought it up. So I guess that kind of speaks volumes to it. Um, yeah, I, By the time this episode of Walking Carpet is aired, we'll both have seen the third episode. And then it's on to that last one. I adore how this is going on alongside the really the beginnings of revenge of the sith and Mm -hmm. maul's insight into palpatine's plan gives me goosebumps the way he's talked about oh it must be happening and how he says it all comes back to skywalker all of that like he knew all of that plan and it just it blows my mind and I've gotten goosebumps ten times since we started talking about this in the last three minutes. It's <laughs> it's it's truly, truly impressive work. And I'm really happy because I wasn't super excited about the first eight episodes of this season and how they felt at times like filler material, even though I can always find the positive in anything Star Wars. Um to have <laughs> <laughs> these episodes go where they've gone and I assume we'll get at least that level of quality for the final two, we're going to really end this series with a bang, I think. And I think it was worth the wait. Absolutely. I will say I also found a lot of the earlier two arcs to be less than impressive. That said, I, I got what they were getting at. Um, I think the bad batch was kind of a safe thing. I think they really just wanted to introduce those characters and not, undeservingly so i mean they're a fun group if you like the a team or gi joe or what have you it's a nice star wars equivalent to those groups um plus like that's a lot of computer assets that have just been sitting as a story reel but that's the thing too the bad batch arcs minus a few you know changes to scenes or you know tightening of the edit like fans who may have been around in 2015 like that was released as an animatic all four episodes five years ago so that story has been out there so it was kind of hard going back and rewatching that, and not that it wasn't absolutely beautiful, but it's like, oh, I've watched this before. And that actually reminded me very much of the original viewing experience for The Clone Wars back in the day when you're watching on Cartoon Network and you're watching week to week. And I appreciate that Disney's doing one episode a week and making this kind of like event television over streaming. But I definitely remember the, oh, this is a story arc I'm not as excited about in The Clone Wars I guess that's just what it's going to be this month (laughs) and hope for a better arc next month. So, you know, there's definitely some arcs, you know, once they started doing the four episode arcs in Clone Wars and seasons four and five and what have you, that, you know, sometimes that just wasn't going to grab you. And not that other fans wouldn't love them and that's great for them. I just knew it was going to be a long month. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good way to put it. Yeah, it's, it was tough when these two arcs were back to back and it was like, all right, we've only got 12 episodes and this is what eight of them are going to be. You know, it's okay, but it's just, this is next level stuff. What we're getting with the the siege here. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this was the whole point. They gave it a last yeah. season. I mean, they didn't make season seven of the clone wars just to put out the bad batch. They did it for the siege of Mandalore. So this is where all their eggs are, you know, in this one basket right now. And yeah. I honestly, I got to say, like, I appreciate 
I didn't love, love a lot of the middle arc with Ahsoka's walkabout, as it's been referred to, but I understand the importance of it and her shifting perspective away from being just a Jedi and her having to find her way out in the galaxy with people who are of less than ideal moral fiber is actually a story worth telling. Did it need to be four episodes? That's up for debate. Um, I certainly think that could have been trimmed down to two or three, but you know, to each their own. That's I'm not the storyteller on that, you know, but I think there is certain value. I mean, there were certain shifts in Ahsoka's point of view in the first episode of the Siege of Mandalore arc when she and Obi-Wan are kind of bristling back and forth about, you know, oh, yeah. what is the best course of action now that we have both Mandalore and Coruscant as, you know, needs in this war. So it's, you know, there are important things there. I loved I loved online when fans, you know, are responding to those middle episodes in the season. It reminded me very much to when The Mandalorian first came out and you got to that midpoint of the season where it's season, you know, one episodes like five, six or seven. And people are just like, guys, The Mandalorian's going nowhere. It's just filler. And in the back of my head, I'm just like, have you watched a Dave Filoni Star Wars project ever? <laughs> right. This is what he does. <laughs> this is what he does. Patience. He'll tell a story that you think is nothing important at all. And exactly, you exert some patience. And then all of a sudden, oh, my God, it tied in. Like, who thought the space whales from the beginning of Rebels were ever going to come back and be important? And by the end of Rebels, everybody loves the Pergils because <laughs> they ended up being important to the ending of the story. Yeah, it's it's a great point. If you ever watched the Dave Filoni series, there you go. That's that's the best way to put it. Yeah, that's what he does. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he does. And uh, you know, there's there's a bit of a roller coaster, but you you take the good with the the mediocre. We'll say sometimes. Yes. All that is to say, the Clone Wars is ending. <laughs> yes. And we're uh, we're excited to to see these final two episodes. Can't wait to talk about it more in detail. Um, I actually did forget about one news item, so we've got two left here. We'll get to this quick. Uh, but Star Wars Battlefront 2, we mentioned it again on Geek Scott Game. It is actually receiving its final major update, and they're calling it the Battle on Scarif. So it's going to come with a, a number of, of different um, kind of game modes within game modes. Of course, you're going to get Scarif as a location, which looks absolutely stunning from the, the hands of the makers at DICE. And you're going to get some new character uh, outfits. There's Emperor Palpatine's look from uh, Rise of Skywalker, Kylo Ren with his reforged mask, and Rey uh, with a yellow lightsaber. Oh, which is kind of cool. Interesting enough, it is a single-bladed lightsaber, which I, I thought could have been a cool little reveal if they decided to make that a double-bladed lightsaber. But alas, it is not. Also, if you have 500 kills with Darth Maul, you can unlock his uh, basically Clone Wars version with the mechanical legs. Kind of cool. And Ooh. if you find the secret on Takodano, which that's what it is. It's the secret on Takodano. Uh, you get Rey's hooded look when she visits uh, Luke Skywalker's ghost in Rise of Skywalker. So lots of cool stuff. I got to appreciate uh, what DICE has done to support that game. 26 free DLC updates since the release of the game. And I know it had a very poor critically received launch with what they were doing with microtransactions, but credit where it is due. Uh, Absolutely. And, uh, Brian mentioned uh, the last thing. How could I possibly forget? But today... The Rise of Skywalker is on Disney Plus, uh, so obviously a lot sooner than it normally would have been. But the the COVID quarantine, I would say, very likely affected this. This was not on schedule to come to Disney Plus till probably about July or August, I would say, because mm -hmm. that's typically the trend with Disney. But now you're going to be able to watch every uh, main movie except for Solo, I believe. Um, yeah, Solo still has its contract with Netflix for a little while, but everything else is on Disney Plus now. So the entire Skywalker saga, as they like to market it, minus Rogue One and Solo, because those films don't matter. <laughs> right. <laughs> to the marketing, I love both those films, just yeah. to clarify. But um, <laughs> it's <laughs> I don't, we don't need to get hate mail on our first episode back that, why do you hate Rogue One? <laughs> uh, no, I think that it's... You know, it's cool. And I, I, I get that, that the, that's the narrative arc that they want to play, especially because Disney is the one responsible for capping that saga for now. 
uh, For now. with oh, yeah. episode seven, eight, nine. I, I strongly believe there will be an episode 10 one day. Mark my words, whether it's under Kathleen Kennedy or somebody else, there will be an episode 10. It's happening. And then it will, it will be a trilogy and they will again, celebrate the end of the saga at episode 12. Cause that's how it goes. <laughs> And that's exactly. Fine. You know what? Give me exactly. in, in another five, ten years, whatever they want to do. I'll be right back in theaters waiting for it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So awesome, awesome news here uh, that we got to tell us uh, at facebook.com slash geekiverse and Twitter. We are at the underscore geekiverse. What you thought, what was your most uh, important news item uh, this month? So our main topic here, we're going to kind of buzz through the 11 movies, including the non-Skywalker movies that we just mentioned. Uh, But we thought, what better way to celebrate our return episode of Walking Carpet, as well as Star Wars Day, with just kind of chronicling maybe one moment or two. What, you know, what's your favorite moment? What was that moment for you? We talk about how excited we've been from the Clone Wars here with Maul and Ahsoka and certain things that just took our breath away. No pun intended, of course. But what, you know, throughout the movies, what was some of your favorite moments? So uh, if we start right with episode one, The Phantom Menace, um, there's, it's funny, this might have been the toughest one for me, Brian, as I was just kind of like jotting down notes. I'm like, oh my gosh, what was that moment for me? Um, I feel mm-hmm. like, you know, the thing that sticks out in my mind is the when Maul is revealed on Naboo, hooded, and ignites both blades. You know, I tried. Yeah. I take that for granted because this this movie's been out for uh, twenty one years now. Jeez, and like that was such a cool reveal to have Maul there. And oh my gosh, he's got a double bladed lightsaber. And it's funny that that was only really the beginning of how legendary Maul would be in all of his appearances uh, that he's going to make through the Clone Wars and Rebels and Solo and again the Clone Wars. So uh, that's it for me. Is there a moment that came to mind for you for Phantom Menace? I actually put the entire duel of the fates. So I'm right there with you. I think that entire lightsaber battle seeing for the first time ever a three person fight to see a double bladed lightsaber in live action. Um, Cause they, they had at the time in the tales of the Jedi comics shown a double bladed lightsaber, but it was a comic book. It was pictures that were still, this is the first time you're seeing it move and actually fight and have a fighting style. And it's so fun. It's so fun watching Ray Park at, you know, his, I don't want to say his physical peak because obviously he's gotten much more proficient in martial arts in his age, but he is just a powerhouse and he is showing off all the cool things you can do with a double bladed lightsaber fighting two Jedi at the peak of their power. It's just such a beautiful moment. And it really like makes the celebration of Star Wars returning in the 90s that much more awesome. I couldn't agree more. And Duel of the Fates is one of my favorite tracks ever from from any Star Wars film from John Williams. Mm -hmm. Um Attack of the Clones. So I actually, I kind of hit two here. I, I think there's a lot that I take away from Attack of the Clones that I always kind of get made fun of for this on, on other Geekiverse shows, how much I love Attack of the Clones. But um, Yoda, I, I remember sitting in theaters and um, man, I must have been 11 or 12 when Attack of the Clones came out. And when Yoda lit that lightsaber... Uh, the theater went wild and I'll never forget mm-hmm. it. And it was so unbelievable. And I think they actually did a pretty good job with it. I understand some people complain about the CG, but uh, that or another moment that kind of took my breath away was Obi-Wan seeing the clone army for the first time on uh, Kamino and hearing that yeah. music start. That was really intense and dark and just felt like it was moving the, the trilogy forward in, in such a way that it had not before. So I, those are, are two for me that, that stuck out. Yeah, those are very good moments. I mean, seeing that gigantic army for the first time, that is something. You know, we, we kind of take it for granted now, seeing the might of the Empire in the original trilogy. But in context, in the story, no one saw a unified army that large before. That was quite something to see. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And even like just from a theatrical standpoint, to have all of all those clones together, the, that was just... Um... You knew something was coming, obviously, but that was like a, a surefire signal. So I actually had two moments also. Um, one is actually very close to yours. I had Obi-Wan versus Django because that's the first time you see a Jedi fight someone who's not a Force user and it actually be like a, a struggle. You know, most times up to this point, whether it be Phantom Menace or the Cantina in A New Hope, whenever the Jedi takes on somebody who doesn't have the force or a lightsaber, it's a pretty short fight. 
But this time, seeing that trained bounty hunter using all of his gadgets, and at the time, you know, this is before it was really like established in the canon that Django and Boba aren't Mandalorians by blood, but merely wearing their armor. You know, this is seeing a Jedi versus a Mandalorian, air quotes, um, at the beginning of what would become the Clone Wars. And this is before the Clone Wars shows, the micro series, before all of that. And this is the first time you're finally getting any allusion to what you hear about the Clone Wars with Jedi versus Mandalorians back in, you know, the 80s and 90s. That was what people thought the Clone Wars really were. And it was really fun having a live action moment of that and showing, yeah, non-Force users are formidable against the Jedi given the right tools. I thought that was really cool. I love that scene. That whole sequence is wonderful. Even um, a little thing. Uh, so Jango Fett walking back onto the Slave One. If you notice, he he kind of ducks. It's like he hits his head there. And <laughs> um, that was uh, George Lucas. I, I he said in one of the commentaries that he did that on purpose to kind of explain that one stormtrooper hitting his head <laughs> on the Death Star in A New Hope as a little funny you know retcon to say, hey, you know, he's the father of these guys. It's it's in their DNA. So kind of funny. Oh, yeah. I, I love those moments of George Lucas, like kind of giving a nod back to, you know, what's come from elsewhere and what yeah. have you. And just kind of, you know, taking a moment that was, you know, not meant to be on purpose and just running with it. I give him a lot of credit for that because he's Same. the creator. He doesn't have to do those things, you know, but yeah. it was really cool. My other one is actually a moment that is very small. And I don't think most people appreciate it the way that they should. I love the elevator scene with Anakin and Obi-Wan right before they actually go to meet Padme at the beginning of the film. Mm -hmm. One, it's the first time you see Hayden Christensen as Anakin Skywalker. So you're already shifting your thoughts a little bit, you know, outside of seeing trailers before the movie coming out in the stories alone. If you were brand new to star Wars, this is the first time you're seeing adult Anakin, you know, so it's no longer Jake Lloyd as a little kid. It's adult Hayden Christensen. And they have this beautiful, like, mentor brother, you know, banter that gets a little bit more um, cutting and biting and acerbic later on in, you know, this movie, beginning of Revenge of the Sith and uh, in the Clone Wars series. But here it's just so pure and it's such a nice moment to have. And I, I love that because... I think if we had a little bit more of that Anakin and Obi-Wan before Anakin saw Padme, that shift of what Padme's effect on Anakin is would be a little bit stronger in the mind of the audience. You know, like you see him as this like good Jedi student who's maybe a little reckless, maybe a little cocky, but overall he's trying to do a good thing. And he and his master actually get along really well. Then the object of his desire comes in and then he's all, you know, talking back and being, you know, much more um, confrontational with his master. And it's a really good shift to have. And I just wish that there was a little bit more there. But what we have is very nice. Yeah, I like that, too. I'm happy you mentioned that. That is a nice little sequence that that kind of establishes their relationship in a quick way. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. We got no Obi-Wan and Anakin time alone time prior to that. And that might be a 60 second scene at most, but it tells you so much about their relationship over the last 10 years. It does. Yeah. Um, Yeah. That's a great call. I like those little moments. Um, I've I've got actually what I think is kind of comparable to that in a few movies down the list here. Uh, But the last of the prequels trilogy. So Revenge of the Sith, episode three. Mm -hmm. This may be an an obvious one, but honestly, I love the, and you may have the same answer, the entire uh, Anakin and Obi-Wan duel. The beginning to end, um, it's funny because we, we, again, we talked about it on our hindsight series and um, some individuals who will remain nameless, just kidding, they said um, they felt the, the fight was too long. For me, I, I loved it. I loved how, how in, in your face it was. Uh, as George Lucas described, it, it was brothers, it was best friends who are now trying to, you know, unfortunately kill each other. I, uh, it was such a, a highly anticipated fight for so long, and we kind of knew how it ended, but to actually see how it actually play out um, was it for me, and that defines the movie. Absolutely. But also, it's, it's you know, watching Obi-Wan's heartbreak throughout that whole sequence. Like, Obi-Wan's not necessarily trying to kill Anakin that entire time. I think there's a lot of Obi-Wan during that fight that wants to just stop Anakin 
and try to, you know, make him listen to reason. And he's kind of grappling with, you know, oh, I might actually have to kill him, you know, during that whole sequence. Brutal. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's a beautiful scene. And, you know, say what you will about the length of it. I think that the emotion behind it, especially at the end with Ewan McGregor shouting on the lava hill that, you know, you are my brother. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that's one of the most poignant moments in the entire prequel trilogy. I think that that moment deserves its praise. Um, I actually had a different moment, though, for Revenge of the Sith. I had these two sequences that show me how amazing George Lucas is as a filmmaker when you don't have to deal with the dialogue. Um, I know that he's gotten a lot of flack for, you know, the writing and the words and the dialogue over the years and say what you will about that. But there are two sequences in revenge of the Sith that play out like a silent film. And that is Anakin and Padme across towers on Coruscant right before Anakin goes to um, essentially become Darth Vader. And then the order 66 sequence. And those two moments play out with no dialogue. And it is just acting, emotion, and John Williams' beautiful score. And a lot of CGI. But but these moments are just so gripping. I mean, the fact that you're watching, you know, Plo Koon and um, Ayla Sakura, which, well, Ayla Sakura less so because she was in the comics at the time, but you barely knew anything about Plo Koon. And, you know, at, when I was saw Revenge of the Sith, I was big on the comic books. And I remember the comic book arc starring Ki-Adi Mundi. Watching him die on screen was very tragic. I really liked that character at the time. And it's so beautiful that those sequences to characters who were not that big in the film have that moment of, you know, betrayal and absolute just despair. And then they're killed. Yeah. by their you know by their comrades essentially and that's what you know i think that we're um since we're recording this prior to the last two clone wars episodes i think we're due for that again uh when order 66 hits uh in these uh finale episodes I it's really... quite hard oh, i'm sorry i, no, I it's re- okay. really cannot wait to see what that happens with that whether it's ahsoka and, and clones or even other jedi that's a that's a really good point yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm definitely emotional throughout the movie, and uh, that's that's great. I I think um, he nailed those. Uh, moving on to to solo. Um, so for for me, you know, my in theater moment, um, and I think we saw it in the same theater, Brian. Uh, I think you're we, right. I was I was like, wait a second. Um, <laughs> so uh, Darth Maul. As soon as he started talking, I, I started slapping. So Jeff Pavlak was sitting next to me from the Geekiverse, and my wife on the other side. And I was I just started hitting their knees, and I don't even think I knew what I was doing. But I just was like, guys, 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 guys. It's Maul. It's Maul. And that <laughs> that that was just wonderful as a lifelong Maul fan here. And uh, the other one was kind of a softer moment. It is Hans uh, notice uh, the his face of betrayal when Kira flies away, and Chewie Ooh. going over and consoling him. Because yeah. it created probably, as we see later on, huge uh, just barriers and trust issues for Han Solo if he didn't already have them. And it established that Chewbacca was going to be there for him. Yeah. And, and so I, I thought that was a nice little peaceful moment. To, and Alden Ehrenreich really did a good job with nailing that emotion, I think. Yeah. People don't give Alden Ehrenreich enough credit. The only sin he ever committed was not being Harrison Ford. Yep, that's it. Yeah, that's the only thing. Get over it. He's He did an amazing job with this script in a production that, I mean, my God, when you hear about the things that happened in that project, it's amazing how good that movie ended up being. Like, Ron Howard crafted a beautiful movie. I still say it's the most fun I've had watching a Star Wars movie in years. Like, from the moment they said the word Karita at the beginning, where, oh, yeah, you're going to the Imperial Academy on Karita, my 90s expanded universe fanboy inside was screaming with joy. And it did not stop until the end of that movie. The mall reveal was my moment that I wrote down, though. Nice. Because that's such a wonderful thing. Like, there were little things throughout that, you know, there's a history. We were talking about this too with George Lucas, like, you know, acknowledging little things that come from other sources or his own, you know, gaffes in the movies, you know, like George Lucas paying it back to fans who or um, other creators in the expanded universe who created things like, you know, like Ayla Sakura or like Coruscant, you know, Coruscant was invented by Timothy Zahn in the air of the empire. And 
what have you. That was not George Lucas's creation. Originally, the Imperial homeworld was going to look more like Mustafar and Exegol put together. But, you know, he went with what was established by somebody else, which he never had to do. And the fact that we got this movie that acknowledged, you know, Karita or the VCX 100, which is the model of the ghost from Rebels, you know, and a few other things, you know, sprinkled throughout the movie, it really made that movie just a jaunt through the sandbox that is Star Wars. And I really loved that about that movie. Like, that's just two hours of playing with your toys. You oh, know? yeah. That was just that was just so fun for me. Yeah, and full of Easter eggs. The mall, yeah. The mall reveal, though, is so huge because, you know, for people who never watched the series before this era where Disney Plus is making Rebels and Clone Wars so readily available, most people who were just film fans didn't know Darth Maul survived. You know, yeah. so that's the first time they're acknowledging that. And yes, it had been established in the canon for years. Oh, yeah. Maul came back. He has this whole arc in the Clone Wars. He has this whole arc in Rebels. And he had actually already died for real on Rebels. So to have him placed in this point uh, in, you know, the timeline here was quite wonderful to just acknowledge that these other media for selling for telling stories is important. It was a really nice touch. I think so too. Uh, other two other you're you know talking about some of the uh, finer details that come through that are you know just points of being a love letter to fans. I think of uh, the Terrace uh, Kasi reference and the I know I know that was my favorite. Yes. <laughs> uh, the Aura Sing even um, with Lando. So yeah, mm-hmm. uh, Solo is often over overlooked in in a lot of ways. It shouldn't be. Oh though. yeah. I mean, add to this list anything Do- Donald Glover does as Lando or any of L3's moments. I mean, the list would just be too long. <laughs> <laughs> it totally would be. <laughs> um, moving on to, to Rogue One. Uh, the, again, this may be, you know, a lot of my choices from here on out are, are relatively obvious. They're not, <laughs> not a, as subtle. But the Vader sequence at the end of Rogue One is possibly, you know, I'd have to really sit down and really scrub this list, but possibly my favorite Star Wars moment ever in seeing that come to light. And I get goosebumps even just thinking about it. And every time I watch it, it is like I'm seeing it for the first time. But him mm-hmm. mowing down the rebels and the pure horror in the faces of the characters there as he is getting closer and closer to achieving his goal. And then thinking about, oh my gosh, that's the last thread that the Rebel Alliance has to keep this thing alive. And he was that close. Makes yeah. the trilogy and a new hope, I would argue, that much better. So for me, it's that Vader moment in Rogue One. Absolutely. And that's actually a really good encapsulation of the movie as a whole, uh, because, you know, we have this whole two hours focusing on a rebel team that we'd never heard of prior to Rogue One. And then you have this sequence where, you know, those plans have to get onto the Tantive IV. That has to happen. But Darth Vader is obviously so much more powerful and stronger. It has a lightsaber and has just that fear and intimidation factor. Like it becomes a horror movie for two minutes when Darth Vader's mowing through all these rebels. And it just shows like, these rebels who are willing to sacrifice themselves for the greater good in that two minutes just shows you this beautiful, you know, um, pared down version of Rogue One as a whole, where these people are deciding to put their lives on the line for a greater cause. And the plans eventually make it on and they get to the Tana V4 and then they get into Leia's hands and then a new hope happens. But it's just so beautiful seeing like that moment for the little guy. Yeah, I, uh, I couldn't agree more. Is, yeah. that, is that your moment or did you have a different one from... I actually had two different moments. Okay. As beautiful as that Vader sequence is, um, my favorites, I was just thinking about it, and there are a lot of really good moments in Rogue One, but I think um, Chirrut, Imwe, and Bay's Malbus's deaths um, during the Battle of Scarif were so powerful and so strong. And for characters that didn't get a ton of screen time, to have that kind of effect was really, really powerful. Um, also, I absolutely love the fact that the last thing that Orson Krennic ever saw is his own creation staring him down in the face before firing. Yep. I love that so much. Oh, that one's so painful and miserable. It's, yeah. It's, that's brutal. That's a great point. And um, man, like that's mind-blowing to put yourself in those shoes and see that coming towards you. 
your life blowing more work. than just mines, Josiah. <laughs> blowing up a whole city. <laughs> yeah, he gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no uh, sequel. That, that was it. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, my my choices are are fairly obvious. They're very obvious when it comes to the original trilogy here. But for mm-hmm. a new hope, um, you know, it's hard because. First time I saw the movie was uh, probably 1996, so I'm going back now. But uh, mm-hmm. Han Solo arriving in the Falcon to save the day uh, before uh, Vader closes in on, on Luke and ends it in the uh, trenches there. That's it. That's that's the most exciting moment, I, w- I would say, throughout uh, a list of exciting moments. But that is the one that stands out most in my mind for A New Hope. Absolutely. Of course. It's a beautiful sequence, and it's really nice to see that you know anti-hero kind of join the good guys for real and it's uh and it'd be a choice not just he was roped along like he was for most of the movie so he had a, that's conscience. a good choice man he did he had a conscience <laughs> kira knew all along he was the good guy yeah <laughs> one of my favorite lines about han solo he's really Absolutely. the good guy <laughs> <laughs> yeah i actually have a, a different han moment my favorite is just his ad libs when they're on the prison uh cell block uh, with, uh, you know, we're all fine here now. How are you? I think that's become <laughs> one of my like most off quoted uh, Star Wars quotes. Um, but I think honestly, like binary sunset when Luke is, you know, going out and staring out into the two sons of Tatooine. I mean, that moment is so iconic for Star Wars that it gets repeated in Revenge of the Sith. It gets repeated in Rise of Skywalker. Um, you know, there's some kind of homage to it. And it gets repeated at the end of The Last Jedi, too. Like, it's repeated so often in the movies and then in the other stories that that really says a lot. And it says a, a lot again. It's another George Lucas silent film moment. You know, you say volumes by just having the actor on the screen and John Williams' music playing. And yeah. you don't have to worry about dialogue. And it shows you so much about Luke's internal struggle. Um, which, you know, I didn't even fully grasp as a kid. I, you know, got the main strokes of it, but you know, growing up, becoming an adult, you just kind of, you feel that moment more every time you see it. Yeah. That, uh, you think back and you're right. How many times has it been repeated throughout the years now? And that, that's the first one that is the one that set the precedent. Yeah. Um, Empire Strikes Back. There's no other moment that I could possibly list here, at least for me. Um, even though there are so many highs throughout this movie and so many intense, Oh shoot kind of moments. Uh, but mm-hmm. the, of course the, the Vader reveal to Luke, I think back to when I saw it and I did see it in theaters, the the special editions when I, I was six, uh, my dad took me to see those. And I remember being surprised by that and, um, not knowing about it beforehand, which was, was really wonderful. Um, of course, one of the most legendary moments in, in cinema history, let alone star Wars history, and of course, one of the the biggest twists ever um, that we saw there, and uh, it kind of helped establish that Star Wars was about family moving forward, and would yeah. would be you know resonating for decades to come. How yeah. about you? It's such a it's such a gift, first of all, that you got to see that in the theater and have that moment be a surprise. Like any time after 1980 that that happens is a a gift to anybody because it's become so iconic. Yeah. Yeah, I actually decided to choose something a little different just for sake of variety. Um, I actually really like Darth Vader's fighting style in Empire Strikes Back. Like it shows one, how much Luke has grown, but also how much Vader doesn't take him seriously as an opponent, mostly because of the information he's about to dispel 10 minutes later, as you've just mentioned. But, (laughs) you know, when you watch him fighting Luke over the course of that, it's it's very similar. Like he doesn't want to kill Luke. He wants to stop Luke. And as Luke is proving his worth, he has to increase his intensity in the fight. But he starts that duel one handed Mm -hmm. like he has one hand on that lightsaber like he's just toying. It's just like, you know, 1930s fencing movie to Darth Vader for the first five minutes of that duel. And then Luke, you know, gets him and then Luke gets him again. And then he has to turn on the force tricks and he gets Luke down for a bit. And then, you know, it's just he then it turns into beating Luke up. But it's such a beautiful transition. Like the storytelling in that duel is absolutely wonderful. Yeah. The, the discussion that goes on during it and you're right, you know, Vader is, 
he's clearly got the upper hand. He's he's almost not taking it seriously, and then he, he goes where he has to. So to see where it starts and where it ends is is truly captivating. I do love the the three phases of that fight where they they start in uh, the carbon freeze chamber, they get to the next hallway, and then where it ends out on the ledge, of course, where Luke loses his hand and, and Vader has the big reveal. Um, oh yeah. yeah, I mean just going from you know the one handed thing to Luke actually landing a blow on Vader's arm. I mean. That says so much. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's when Vader wakes up and goes, all right, and I'm screwing around. I'm taking your hand. (laughs) Yep. There it goes. (laughs) Um, In Return of the Jedi, uh, more Darth Vader for me. Uh, But the moment for me is Vader's realization that, uh, you know, the light side calls him back, essentially picks up Palpatine and has sympathy and compassion for his son Luke um, is such a beautiful moment to me where he decides to do the impossible and return from the dark side or seemingly impossible and kind of fulfill that prophecy as uh, as the chosen one or at least at the time from from what we knew then but that um, yeah that all of that and seeing him look back at Palpatine his his master for the last however many decades just absolutely ripping in to, to Luke from a purely evil standpoint to Luke crying out to for his help to see the dichotomy there to see him be in the middle as he chooses in revenge of the sith and palpatine uh is uh dueling with mace windu and he says choose you must choose and this time he makes the right choice and it, you know yeah. obviously it's his son and it's the light side and it, you know the rest of the story but for me that's uh that's my moment from return of the jedi that's a beautiful choice sir beautiful Thank choice you. So again, I've picked the prequel to your choice. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I, I chose about five minutes before yours uh, where Luke decides he's not going to kill Vader and he turns off his lightsaber, throws it away, and he declares, I'm a Jedi like my father before me. That is like the reason Return of the Jedi remains my favorite movie. Like you have all these people who are trying so hard to push you to fight, to push you into a role, much like Palpatine did with Anakin for the entire set of the prequels. And you have this manipulation going on for that entire throne room sequence with Luke. And he would rather walk away than give in. And I've just always really appreciated that. I I think that's wonderful. And I think, um, you know, I, this is something I could spend an hour talking on, but I think that led into so much what Luke was in last Jedi and people seem to maybe not see that side or understand it. What, uh, what Ryan Johnson knew about Luke Skywalker. Um, Absolutely. I did, I did write an article on it a few years ago, which you can see um, at the geekiverse.com and maybe I'll throw a link in the article for this video here. But um, yeah, I think uh, that was, Luke showing that he was better. He, he was better than being able to to be concocted or tempted by by the dark side there. Absolutely. And I agree with you. I think that that is worth discussion of how Luke portrayed in the original trilogy is, you know, feeding into The Last Jedi as opposed to fan wish fulfillment. And don't get me wrong, like I would have loved to see Luke as the action hero too. But, you know, there's so much information given to you and who that person is that you just have to honor that. Maybe that's a good discussion for our next episode. I'll, we'll jot some notes down and throw that around. I think that might be a good one. (laughs) Yes, maybe so. (laughs) Coming soon. (laughs) Um, The force awakens. So there's again, this, this movie for me, so many moments. I just adored the film so much. Um, If it's not, finally seeing Luke at the end of the movie who was absent from all the marketing and not getting any imagery of him. If it's not that it's Ray calling the lightsaber to her in the, the duel uh, with Kylo Ren and realizing that the force did awaken in her and that the, I wrote an article on this as well, that through the force, the lightsaber really didn't want to go to Kylo Ren in a way. And it listened to Ray and it went to her hand. Um, and I just thought it was so powerful and it was like, Oh my gosh, Ray's got the lightsaber. And then uh, we went from there. But uh, again, could list a number of moments. That was it for me. Someone who really, really adores the character of Ray. Absolutely. And I know how much you love uh, Force Awakens. So I'm, I admire your restraint right now and only having two moments. <laughs> it, I had to I had to just stop there. It, it would have been too That's bad. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had... I had Ray arriving on Octo and seeing Luke for the first time. That 
slow turnaround. Just it's two hours of anticipation to finally see Luke because, like you said, there's no marketing, no imagery, nothing in the story other than like mentions and wondering and you know all that. And then all of a sudden, you're finally there, and you just see this hooded figure, and you turn around. And he's got the beard and it's kind of like a mashup of his return of the Jedi and the prequel Jedi outfits. And it's all white. Like he's space Jesus. And it's just, it's so freaking beautiful. I was just like, wow, she did it. She found the wizard. Like, I remember having that thought in my head at the end of the force awakens. And it's just like, I, I, that was the one point watching the force awakens the first time, like tears were forming in my eyes. I, I, a lot of my moments are Luke related for obvious reasons. He's my favorite character. And it's just that alone was just the anticipation. And then that's still more anticipation. Like we didn't know at the time where the last Jedi was going to go or where episode eight, cause there was no title, but we didn't know what was coming next. And it was just, Oh, the places they could go from here. Oh yeah. You know? Just such, just that such wonder. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. That moment, our, our theater, I'll never forget it. it. My friend TJ sitting next to me, he's going, yes, yes. And like everyone was just in an uproar and applause. And it was, that's been my favorite part of the sequel trilogy is sitting in theaters on opening night with just, you know, a hundred other Star Wars fans who, who who love it just as much as you do. It's so exciting. So that moment, what a, what a beautiful ending to a beautiful movie. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, Last it's- Jedi, honestly, this was the easiest one for me, believe it or not. Um, a quick runner-up, as, as we've been talking about Luke Skywalker, would be, to me, Luke Skywalker walking out, or the ghost, or not the ghost, the projection of Luke Skywalker facing down the First Order, you know, basically saying, what, am I going to walk out with a laser sword, as he says earlier in the movie? And he does that. Yep. Um, <laughs> that is just iconic imagery. It's a painting to me. Um, but uh, Kylo Ren killing Snoke, and right after him and Ray teaming up at that point in where we were in the last Jedi, I very badly wanted Ben Solo and Ray to become uh, a team. I wanted that team up so bad and to see them go on an adventure after that. Um, obviously we didn't get it, but still that throne room sequence and I, John uh, Williams score there as, as Snoke is just as shocked as the audience is truly one of my that is up there with the darth vader scene from rogue one for me for some of my all-time favorite star wars moments just the the way they teamed up even to the way it ends which could have been a little bit action cheesy but with kylo ren with he finally gets to hold by the way the the blue lightsaber and how it goes on and off (laughs) and he destroys him uh the the guard man uh that's it for me that is one i could watch over and over and over again that is actually a small gripe I have with The Last Jedi. I, I, it's small, but it's the fact that he finally gets to hold the Skywalker lightsaber and it doesn't have like that, you know, gravitas where in The Force <laughs> yeah. Awakens, he's like, that lightsaber belongs to me. Like he considers it his birthright and he finally has the thing and he's not doing anything with it. It's That's a fair point. B- but I guess actually, it's funny. I'm just kind of thinking about this now. Like because of his whole let the past die, that actually tracks... All right. Yeah. Well, we're learning, Again, we're Ryan learning things today. Yeah, Ryan Johnson. <laughs> Go ahead. You, you genius, you. Um, yeah, my favorite, uh, to the surprise of nobody, was the one you had as your runner-up, was Luke facing down the First Order. One, yes, he absolutely said that line at the beginning of the movie, and then have it realized at the end through the Force projection was a very nice bit of, uh, of filmmaking there. But I also appreciate it on, one... You know, this is that little bit of fan wish fulfillment where Luke is being viewed, whether it's him in body or him in that force projection, as the hero everybody kind of wanted him to be, you know, from post-original trilogy. And in the Legends canon, the old expanded universe, there is one comic uh, called Dark Empire, which actually uh, is funny because it it features a lot more prominently through things in Rise of Skywalker. But there's a moment at the beginning of that comic book where... Um, Han and Leia are going through war-torn Coruscant and they see Luke and an AT-AT comes in and Luke actually takes down the AT-AT by himself just standing it down and using his lightsaber and the force and seeing Luke faced up against all those ATM-6 walkers and all of the other you know first order artillery it just evoked that scene from you know my childhood again 
So that added a little extra flavor onto that beautiful moment already and just the storytelling of the movie. I love that mo- part very much. Yeah, it's just, it's simply put beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Rise of Skywalker may, this moment may surprise uh, listeners, but for me, maybe the, again, man, could talk about so many. I'll list a quick runner up, and it's when all of the ships appear at the end of the movie when Poe Dameron hears Lando coming back, because that evoked uh, Avengers Endgame to me, when all our heroes return, and and they are behind Captain America. That was this to me, and it was so beautiful seeing the overwhelming amount of ships on screen as you look at the depth of of field, and it was just unbelievable that they came to save the day. But my moment is actually when uh, uh, Kylo Ren has his moment with Han Solo, or Ben Solo Mm -hmm. has his moment with Han. And yeah. that whole sequence is hard for me not to tear up when I watch it. It's such a beautiful dad son moment where he needs his dad. He needs his parents. And even though Han's not really there, he's there for him. And he kind of puts his mind at ease. And it was so beautiful to see the scene from Force Awakens where everything really, really goes to a new level of hell for Kylo Ren. Mm-hmm. To, to see Han Solo say, no, Kylo Ren is dead. My son is alive. That gets me every single time, and it's so beautiful, and it encapsulates the um, the family aspect that I've mentioned frequently about Star Wars. So uh, it's funny, Jeff Pavlock again of the Geekiverse. Since Force Awakens came out, had this um, this fun, far fetched fan, a little bit far fetched fan theory where he said Han Solo is coming back as some sort of Force ghost at some point, and in a way. He was right, even though Han Solo was not a, a Force user. Uh, but to see that kind of prediction come to light, uh, you know, a few years later was always fun as, as his friend. But yeah, um, Han Solo and Ben Solo to me. Yeah, no, that's such a beautiful sequence. Just the book ending it has with that sequence from Force Awakens. You know, when you really see the conflict of Kylo Ren. You know, again, it's not that he's whiny it's that he's conflicted and seeing that inner torment displayed and him opening up to one of the few people he would be willing to open up to is just so beautiful and that transformation into who ben solo becomes in the last moments of his life is just so beautiful yeah that that combined with um ben solo at the end of this movie was mine um i really loved everything adam driver did to change who Kylo Ren was to who Ben Solo was. And keep in mind, the only dialogue he has after that sequence is ow. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. No words. And, but everything else, like his posturing, his attitude, his fighting style, his, you know, the the cocky Han Solo shrug he gives to, you know, his former, you know, Knights of Ren comrades. All of that is so wonderfully portrayed by Adam Driver. And it just makes that character have so much more life and it really makes you wish that you had more time with that character you know whether you know he would have ended just by being pushed down the the crevice or his sacrifice to save ray like when he finally goes it's a sad thing and given everything that kylo ren had done and given how the fandom had treated kylo ren for a lot of the sequel trilogy's production run it's really nice that that moment is so earned I, agree, I couldn't agree more. And it's funny, a lot of our moments, especially as we went on here, kind of tied into each other's. Um, and you mentioned his nod or his callback to you know Han Solo's kind of cockiness and how he changed his, his tune completely. Uh, you know, He gets that, again, that Skywalker lightsaber, that would have been a fun moment for him to finally have it, maybe. But for yeah. the first time, regardless, he gets that and how he just kind of mows down the Knights of Ren and how fast he twirls it really evokes a sense of Anakin back in the prequels to me, Uh, which of course, you know, his, his role model in a way. Um, So man, yeah. Ben Solo, uh, Adam Driver in particular, was a gem, someone we did not deserve. (laughs) (laughs) So incredible moments all the way around him. Beautiful discussion here. Um, Obviously Brian and I could talk Star Wars all day. We live eat breathe star wars Uh, we want to hear some of your favorite moments again get involved with us on social media we're going to wrap up this return episode of walking carpet brian um if you so choose where can people find you if they want to interact with you on social media and um anything to to plug it all in in your personal professional life 
Not at the moment, thanks to coronavirus, but whenever we are on the other side of this, I am directing the annual Buffalo Bison Star Wars Night yes. uh, post-game show. Uh, I have been doing it, thankfully, uh, for a long time now with a little gap in the middle uh, with the members of the Northridge uh, Fan Forest Group in Buffalo. They are a wonderful group that raises a lot of money for local charities, dressing up as Star Wars characters and using their nerd powers for good. Uh, so I would say that the best places to find me personally would be Instagram or Twitter at BP Stoyle, or finding the North Ridge online on Twitter or Facebook at the North Ridge or on Instagram at North Ridge Buffalo. Good stuff all around. Can't wait to see what you guys have up your sleeves when that finally rolls around for Star Wars Night in Buffalo. Uh, if you're in the area, even if you're just a few states away, uh, make the drive for it. Get tickets early when this does come back because they go fast every single year and this sells out. Uh, I am at Josiah D. Leroy on all social media. You can find me there talking about Star Wars, Disney, um, video games, you name it. We've got a lot going on. One quick thing to plug um, is we just began our new kind of mini-series, uh, MCU Review. We are doing one Marvel Cinematic Universe movie a week, and we are talking about it spoiler cast format. Uh, we want to do that as a community. So we've got a checklist going on at thegeekiverse.com. You'll find it easily on all our social media. Go through, watch a movie a week, and then check out our uh, Marvel Monday discussion every Monday, of course. It's been a pleasure, Brian, talking Star Wars with you. I look forward to doing this uh, once a month here. This is going to be a, a lot of fun, I think. Uh, thanks uh, so much for, for being my co-host for this. I really appreciate it. Thank you for asking me, Josiah. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, I appreciate it. So this has been Walking Carpet on YouTube and wherever you download your podcasts. For Brian, I'm Josiah. We'll catch you soon. We hope you have a wonderful Star Wars day. May the 4th be with you. Somebody get this big walking carpet out of my way. Chewie.